Murder by Experts. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents Murder by Experts with your host and narrator, Mr. John Dixon Carr, world-famous mystery novelist and author of the recently published bestseller, The Life of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This is John Dixon Carr. Each evening at this time, Murder by Experts brings you a story of crime and mystery. Murder by Experts debuted over Mutual on June 13, 1949. Written by David Cogan and Bob Arthur, it quickly gained respect and approval from the radio world at large. Mystery writers like John Dixon Carr and Brett Halliday, hosted with New York's best character talent, like Lawson Zerby, Ann Shepard, Santos Ortega, Ralph Bell, and William Zuckert being featured. This is from the debut episode, Summer Heat, which aired on June 13, 1949. Mr. Pentecost says of this thriller, the story has not only a twist, but an unforeseen double twist, which takes one completely by surprise. And now we present Summer Heat. Look now at the old elms, the ivy-covered buildings on the campus of a small Midwestern university. It's a fine June afternoon when you hear laughter and the greetings of the reunion of the class of 36. Twelve years have passed, but none of the members of the class seems much older to each other. There's the dark-haired Paul Baxter wandering rather strangely... There are two of his old friends, prosperous now, judged by their clothes, and boisterous in greeting. Paul! Paul Baxter! You old rascal! It's sure good to see you again. Oh, hello, Steve. Bert, this is a surprise. Uh, why didn't you have a right to us, Paul? You had our addresses. Why, but... sure. That's no way to treat old classmates. Just think, 12 years. Yeah. Oh, they sure have gone fast. Too fast to suit me. <laughs> Say, Paul, you've turned off a gray for only 33. <laughs> well, he always did take things too seriously. I suppose by now, Paul, you're one of the biggest lawyers in the state, huh? How's Marcia? Yeah, you were all set to marry her after graduation, remember? Yes, and you were going to become her father's junior law partner. Oh, you sure had a sweet setup there. <laughs> well, uh... Things worked out a, a little differently. You see, that party we had graduation night. Do you remember it? Remember it? <laughs> How can we forget it? <laughs> oh, that was a real blowout. And <laughs> were you tight, Paul? <laughs> well, you know, that party uh, sort of changed my whole life. Changed your life? Well, how? Well, I, uh, I, I don't remember much about the party itself. I... I guess I had too many drinks. In fact, I, I don't remember anything until I woke up the next morning. I could hear old Trinity ringing. I awoke to find myself on the couch in my living room. It was noon. And the room was hot. Stiflingly hot. I remembered I had a date with Marcia and her father at one o'clock. I got to my feet... My head ached. There were heat waves before my eyes. Feeling sick, I staggered toward my bedroom, and then I saw him. A man, asleep on my bed, his back to me. For a moment, I stood there, trying to remember if someone had come home from the party with me. But the night before was a total blank. I crossed to the bed, bent over, shook his shoulder. Hey, fella. Hey, it's noon. Wake up. Come on, wake up. As I shook him, he had flopped over and looked up at me with staring eyes. He was dead. And there was a knife in his chest. My hunting knife. I stood stunned, staring down at the body on my bed. The dead man was an utter stranger to me. He was neatly dressed in old clothes. And my knife, 
My knife was in his heart. I killed him. I couldn't remember when or how or why, but I'd killed him. Frantically, I, I tried to remember what had happened. Was he a panhandler? Someone I'd met on the street and drunkenly brought home with me? I didn't know. I couldn't remember. As I stood there, trying to get a grip on myself, I suddenly realized there was someone at the door. Instinctively, I walked into the living room and towards the door. Just as I was about to open it, I realized the danger of letting anyone into the apartment. I put my ear against the door and listened. I heard voices. Yours, Steve. And yours, Bert. <laughs> hey, Paul, open up. We want to say goodbye. Come on, Paul. Wake up, will you? We're leaving for California in 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I guess old Paul isn't in. Yeah. I wonder how he felt when he woke up. <laughs> Boy, what a head he must have had. <laughs> Still, I'd sure hate to leave without saying goodbye. Well, he has our California address. He yeah. can write to us. Come on, or we'll miss that train. <laughs> then they were both gone, and I dared to breathe again. I tried to think calmly, figure out what to do. I knew I should call the police, but they... They might charge me with murder. And what defense could I offer? I thought of Marcia. The slightest scandal and everything would be off. Our marriage, my job, my future... I couldn't call the police. I couldn't call them and sacrifice everything I'd worked for. Somehow I had to get the body out of my apartment, get rid of it before it was found. Then he came to me. My car was in the basement, garage. The dumbwaiter in the kitchen led down to the basement. I could put the dead man in the dumbwaiter, lower him to the basement, get him in my car, and then... Mr. Paul! Oh, Mr. Paul! It was Jenny, the cleaning woman. She'd let herself in with a key... I hurried into the living room, closing the bedroom door behind me. Oh, there you are. A fine time for a rising young lawyer to be getting up. Oh, hello, Jenny. I, I, I guess I overslept. I was at a party last night. A party, was it? <laughs> Everyone on the campus is talking about it. And the complaints. Well, now, step aside and let me into that bedroom. i got to start cleaning. Jenny, can't you come back later and do the place? No, I can't. Now get out of my way. Jenny, wait. I don't want you to clean up yet. Oh, what's wrong? What... Why are you blocking the door like that? Well, th the truth of the matter is, one of the boys had a bit too much last night, and he's in my bedroom sleeping it off. Oh, well, get him out of there. Take him to a Turkish bath. Turkish bath. Oh, yes, that's, that's a good idea. Look, Jenny, just give me half an hour to get him dressed and out of here. Then you can come back and clean up. A half hour, nothing. I'll give you exactly five minutes. All right, Jenny, I'll have him out of here by then. You'd better. She was gone, and I had five minutes, just five minutes. I went into the bedroom and quickly went through the dead man's pockets. They were empty. There was no identification in them. The thin, pinched face told me he was a nobody, a derelict, someone who might never be missed. As I was about to lift him off the bed, the phone rang. A shrill ring filled the room. Hello? Hello, darling. Marcia. How was your stag party last night? Did you miss me? Miss you? <laughs> You sound as though you have a dreadful hangover. Hangover? Oh, yes. Oh, excuse me a minute, Marcia. There's someone at the door. Yes? I'll be coming in to clean your room in another minute, Paul. Jenny. So get your friend out of there. Oh, yes, Jenny, yes. Just give me another minute and uh, we'll be out of here. Marcia, I, I can't talk to you any longer. I, I'm in a hurry. Then you haven't forgotten your appointment with Father and myself at one o'clock. No, no, no. I may be a little late, but I'll be there. Paul, you mustn't be late. I've told you over and over what a stickler Father is for punctuality. He can't stand people who are late for appointments. Well, you recall how furious he was when you didn't I know, show Marcia, but I... You have 45 minutes to shave, shower, and dress. That's plenty of time. And, Paul, wear your gray flannel suit with a blue knitted tie and be sure you're there on Yes, time, Marcia, darling. yes, but I've got to hang up. Jenny will be coming back any minute that I... Well, what if she is? Now, darling, you haven't forgotten what we discussed yesterday afternoon. Yesterday afternoon? Yes. Now, I know Father's brusque and inclined to bully people, but don't let it upset you. After all, it's our future he's... Marcia, I can't talk any longer. I've got to hang up. Jenny will be back. I've only seconds left. What in the world are you talking about? Now, when Father asks Marcia, you... I've got to hang up. I've got to. Goodbye. I hung up the phone and wiped the sweat running down my face. It took only a moment to lift him off the bed, carry him into the kitchen, pull the dumbwaiter up and put his body into it. I closed the door to the dumbwaiter, ran out of the apartment and started down the stairs to the basement. <laughs> 
I got down to the basement to find Ben, the janitor, leisurely pulling on the dumbwaiter rope. Ben! Oh, Ben! Oh, hello, Paul. If it's your car you're after, it's there by the door, all washed like you asked. Thanks, but Ben, stop a minute, will you? I, I want you to do something for me. Sure, Paul, just as soon as I've emptied this dumbwaiter... Will you stop blowing that dumbwaiter? Stop it! Here! Hey, what's wrong with you? You're acting mighty strange. I... I'm sorry, I... I shouted like that, Ben. It's just that... There, there's a package up in my apartment that I'd like you to mail right away. There, there's a dollar in it for you. All right. But there ain't no need to rush. Today's Sunday. The post office is closed. Closed? Sure. Say, what's the matter with you anyway? Must be the heat. Uh, something awful heavy on this somewhere. Ben, wait, wait a minute. There's something else. How's that? Stop a minute, will you? How can I talk to you while you're lowering that dumbwaiter? Well, go ahead. I can hear everything you're saying. Let go of that rope. Let go of you hear it. Hey. You going crazy or something? I've half a mind to call the super and tell him why... No, 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 don't do that. I... I... Ben, uh, up in my apartment, there's a bottle. Bottle? Yes, I, I brought it home last night. It, it's half full. I, I wanted you to have it for cleaning the car. Oh, thanks. I sure appreciate that, Paul. Uh, uh, I'll go up and get it as soon as I've emptied this dumbwaiter. It's almost down now. But Ben, Jenny just went in to clean. You know how she feels about drinking? Huh, Jenny? Jumping grasshoppers. Why didn't you say so? That woman will pour it all down the drain if I don't get there first. As soon as Ben disappeared up the stairs, I pulled the dumbwaiter the rest of the way down, opened the door, and he fell into my arms. Slinging the body over my shoulder, I staggered with it to my car and swiftly dropped him on the floor in the back. It was an old touring car. The top was long since gone. To hide the body from view, I, I covered it with an old blanket. A moment later, I started the motor and rolled smoothly out of the basement and into the driveway. As I did, I heard Ben shouting to me from my window. Oh, hey, Paul, wait a minute. I got something. I pretended not to hear Ben calling. Instead, I stepped on the gas. I was almost proud of myself as I drove past the campus. I was in trouble, but I was thinking fast, as a good lawyer should. I'd already decided I'd have to get rid of him by dumping him into the river. Murder by Experts won a prestigious Edgar Award in 1950 and aired until December 17, 1951. Very little traffic, and I was just about to speed up when behind me I heard a whistle blowing. It was Dugan, the town's only traffic cop, and he was blowing for me to stop. There was nothing to do but pull over to the curb. As Dugan hurried up to me, I realized I'd driven through a red light. Hello, Dugan. Hello.